Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. This is Kurt Rappencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. History isn't always pretty, especially when it's history about the Civil War. Our story about whether statues in national parks that honor the Confederacy should be removed drew an enormous outpouring of pushback to the suggestion. Other stories we brought you this past week included a look at how Yellowstone Forever, the nonprofit charged with raising money for Yellowstone National Park, is recovering from a near fatal financial crisis, how Banff National Park officials are working to reduce wildlife train deaths in that iconic Canadian park, and word that visitation to U.S. national parks last year was down by nearly a third, a story that some questioned in light of crowds seen in Yellowstone, Grand Teton, Zion, and some other national parks. You can find those and other stories about national parks and protected areas at nationalparkstraveler.org. In this week's show, we're going to be talking about the building blocks of coral reefs. Coral is a foundation species, one that creates the habitats that support biodiversity and provides essential shoreline protection. The waters of Dry Tortugas National Park, which lies about 60 miles to the west of Key West, Florida, are home to some 30 species of coral. One type, elkhorn coral, rises above the rest, literally and figuratively, for its importance in the region. It also happens to be the most threatened. So, a team of researchers from the U.S. Geological Survey looked into whether elkhorn coral grown in nursery conditions would have success after being transplanted in the Dry Tortugas National Park and other areas of the Florida Keys. The traveler's Lynn Riddick got the details about the study and how it was succeeding from lead investigator Dr. Ilsa Kuffner, who says the findings are encouraging, as well as the shift in the way people have started to think about reef conservation. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Petrero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with a breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com. That's P-O-T-R-E-R-O group.com. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. Dry Tortugas National Park is about 100 square miles, and most of that is water. There are seven small islands in the park, and one is entirely taken up by a huge military fort. Fort Jefferson was under construction for 30 years between 1846 and 1875 and never completed. There are also other strongholds that have played a huge role in protecting the park that are also never complete. Coral reefs, some dating back 10,000 years, and they are suffering. Most notably, elkhorn coral, which has an extremely important function in the tropical Atlantic Ocean. My guest today is Dr. Ilsa Kuffner. She's a research marine biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey at the St. Petersburg Coastal and Marine Science Center in Florida. She's here to share findings from a recent study on elkhorn coral transplantation in the Dry Tortugas and Florida Keys. Hi, Ilsa. Welcome to The Traveler. Hi. Thank you, Lynn. I'm happy to be here. Before we get into details about your study regarding Acropora palmata, or elkhorn coral, 
Would you describe exactly what coral is and how it grows? Sure. So corals are animals. They are in the phylum Cnidaria, which are a group of animals that most of them are in the ocean and uh, they're related to jellyfish and sea anemones and the like. But corals are sessile, meaning they live attached to the bottom of the ocean. They also have an important symbiosis with single-celled dinoflagellate algae that live inside their tissues. So I like to think of them as uh, farmers, where they, but they have their farm inside their bodies. And these dinoflagellates are called uh, zooxanthellae, and they can produce up to about 90% of the coral animals' nutritional needs. Now, how exactly do the colonies grow and spread? So, uh, yes, you, you are correct. The corals are colonial animals, so they grow by budding new polyps. Uh, so if you look at a colony of coral, it'll be filled with numerous polyps. Each polyp is like an individual, but they're all connected to each other and can share resources. Some species of coral can reproduce by breaking off branches or having the colony split in whatever way causes that, storms and, and other uh, disturbances. And then that piece can then reattach to the reef and form a new colony. And tell us why coral reefs are so important and not just for the enjoyment of snorkelers and divers. So coral reefs perform a number of ecosystem services that humans depend upon and other animals, of course, and plants. So they're what are known as foundation species or ecosystem engineers, meaning they create the habitat itself, like trees produce the forest. And, uh, you know, these foundation species, some of them can create reefs that are meters thick and structures that accumulate over thousands of years and thus can be seen from satellites in space. They're, they're enormous structures. Uh, so they produce habitat and that can support important fisheries and biodiversity. But then another really important function is as protectors of shorelines. Basically, along coastlines in tropical and subtropical environments, reefs build up and form what is like an underwater rampart so that waves and storms uh, coming across the reef, uh, that energy gets dissipated, uh, greatly reducing the amount of wave energy that reaches the shoreline, which would otherwise cause coastal erosion and inundation of coastal communities. So that shoreline protection feature is of particular importance to the species that we'll talk about later uh, that I focus my research on. And I know there's not a simple answer to this question, but give us a big picture of how and why coral reefs are dying off in oceans around the globe. Yes, so coral reef degradation is a global problem. So we've seen degradation of, of reef eco ecosystems the world over. And the two primary reasons for coral mortality have been coral bleaching, which results from high temperature uh, events. So like an underwater heat wave, basically. And uh, this disrupts the symbiosis that the coral has with their symbionts. And what results is the coral looks bleached or white because all of the zooxanthellae leave the colony. And therefore the colony basically starves to death because it no longer has that uh, nutritional input from their symbionts. Any idea how many coral varieties are threatened across the globe and maybe which are in the most danger of irreversible damage or has some damage already been done that is irreversible? So, um, well, the other major cause of coral mortality going on right now is coral disease. And there, there seems to be species specific patterns to each type of disease as it develops. And 
right now, currently in the in the Florida Keys and now across the Western Atlantic, there is a horrible disease going on called stony coral tissue loss disease. And it targets about 20 species of coral that um, are basically being wiped out as this disease sweeps across reefs. In the Florida Keys, that was between 2014 and it's still ongoing. So uh, those species of corals are becoming very rare. And some of them like the pillar coral are iconic. And it's uh, you know looking like there will be some at least local extinction events. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the coral along the Florida Reef Track, which extends westward from the Florida Keys to the Dry Tortugas National Park. The park, I guess you could say, is at the end of the line for the reef track. What can you tell us about the waters surrounding the park and the Keys? And aside from the damage done by the diseases, what are the reef ecosystems like there? So the Florida Keys are, uh, they're at the the northern limit for coral reef development. So because it is a subtropical habitat and the reefs around dry tortugas are actually one of the best examples of a reef population that is thriving in comparison with other reefs in the Florida Keys, uh, which is one of the reasons why it was so important to include dry tortugas in our experiments. Uh, because it is an end member uh, and it, it's in a unique situation because of how it's connected to the rest of the Caribbean and Florida. It's kind of like at the nexus of really important and, and uh, strong ocean currents. So you have the, the Yucatan current that comes from the Caribbean, which becomes the loop current into the Gulf of Mexico. And then that horseshoes around and turns eastward again, uh, right near the dry tortugas. And uh, it's a very dynamic current. So it'll spin off eddies and uh, go um, sometimes deep into the Gulf of Mexico and sometimes not at all. And that dynamic oceanographic position um, creates these cyclonic eddies that basically suck water from deep and uh, it shoals across the Dry Tortugas platform. And so it creates a much different oceanographic setting than the rest of the Keys. Uh, but it also is connected to the rest of the Keys because of that Florida current. So the, the loop current then becomes the Florida current, which is basically the Gulf Stream. And so it flows from a south to north direction and of course goes all the way up to, to Bermuda. And you say there's no other coral reefs to be found in the US north of that Florida reef track? Well, the reef development ends around uh, the Miami area, but there are corals found north of there into Palm Beach County and, and um, like up to Jupiter Inlet and it would be a stretch to call those coral reefs though. It's more um, relic reefs, fossil reefs that, that lived and had their heyday in the mid Holocene. And now that hard substratum, that old reef, um, which still performs a role of, of coastline protection, even though it's no longer accreting or growing, but it's covered with uh, sparse populations of some of our hardier species of coral that can grow up north. And the Holocene era is 11,000 years ago? Yes, that's correct. That's uh, marked a time when sea level um, started to rise pretty quickly. How many species of coral are there in the Dry Tortugas area? Uh, there's about 30 species of coral, I believe, and they can... Uh, it's, it's pretty much the same suite of species that you find throughout the Florida Keys. 1846, when the building of Fort Jefferson began, what do you think coral reefs looked like then? Well, that's interesting uh, because we have one of the best 
um, records of what reefs looked like because the fort was built there. And then uh, the Carnegie Lab, which was one of the first tropical marine uh, laboratories in the world, uh, was located at Loggerhead Key, right north of Garden Key, where the Civil War era fort is. And there were scientists that were coming to study the Dry Tortugas area since um, around the, the time that the fort was starting to be built, of course. And we know that there was a lot more coral back then. And in fact, Elkhorn coral, which is one of the very important species for shoreline protection, extended all along Bird Key Reef, which basically um, protected the, the anchorage and Garden Key where the fort is during storms that were coming from the south. And that population has now dwindled down to a single colony uh, and, and a single genetic clone that's in, in that area. And that's the only place in the park where that species is currently found. Elkhorn coral is listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Why is this type of coral suffering so much? And why is it especially important to that part of the continent? So the elkhorn coral is the only species that builds the reef crest habitat zone, which is the part of the reef that makes waves break. And so essentially it's the only species that is really important to shoreline protection in the entire Atlantic Ocean. And late in the 1970s, the populations throughout the Caribbean basin uh, started to suffer from white band disease, which basically was a, an unidentified pathogen that caused immediate and quick tissue loss. And uh, the corals died off from white band disease uh, within about a decade or, or so. And they've failed to recover since, which resulted in the ESA listing in 2006. What about tropical storms, hurricanes? Have they played a part in uh, the destruction of coral in that area? So actually, for elkhorn coral, no. Uh, they are very good and they have evolved to asexually reproduce through fragmentation. So there's a lot of examples um, that are pretty well documented in the literature showing that after storms, uh, most of the fragments that are produced, because you know, these do, uh, the, the coral branches do break from the storms, but most of them can actually reattach to the substratum and start new colonies. So elkhorn coral in particular, but also the staghorn coral, the, its sister species, have evolved to basically use storms as a way of, of reproducing and, and um, spreading to new areas nearby. How big does elkhorn coral get? It's, it's a very impressive species. Uh, when it's thriving, it can grow to be 10 to 15 feet high and 20 feet long. It's an incredibly large species of coral when it's thriving. I want to ask some questions going back to the Carnegie Institute uh, research facility established there. Um, I read that in 1908, the area was designated as a natural resource refuge, and then the Institute created the first coral reef research laboratory there uh, in the Western Hemisphere. What do you know about the research that went on back then? So there were a lot of really interesting firsts that happened at the Carnegie Lab. One of the example is that there were the first coral growth studies where they looked at what factors contributed to growth or inhibited growth. Um, some of the first temperature uh, stress challenges happened at the Carnegie Lab right after the turn of the century. The first underwater photograph was taken of a hogfish there, uh, I believe around 1920s or so. Sounds like it was pretty advanced for the time. Indeed, yes. Uh, it was hard to get to. That was before there was uh, a railroad. So people got on ships in, um, you know, mostly New England area and, 
you know, traveled by sailboat all the way down to the Dry Tortugas and they'd stay there for the entire summer. One of the interesting facts about the Carnegie Lab though was that women were not allowed to be on the island whatsoever. There were no women marine biologists back then. Interesting. That might be a subject for another podcast later. (laughs) (laughs) I'm speaking with Dr. Ilsa Kuffner. After this short break, she will share the results of her Elkhorn coral research and why they are encouraging. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. Western National Parks Association is a nonprofit education partner of the National Park Service. WNPA supports parks across the West, developing products, services, and programs that enhance the visitor experience, understanding, and appreciation of national parks. Learn more at WNPA.org. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It is an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. I'm Lynn Riddick, and I'm back with Dr. Ilsa Kuffner from St. Petersburg Coastal and Marine Science Center in Florida. You are the lead investigator of a study just published by the U.S. Geological Survey in which nursery-grown Elkhorn coral was transplanted in the Dry Tortugas National Park and other locations in the Florida Keys. How did this study come about, and what were you hoping to learn? I started what is now called the USGS Coral Assessment Network, or USGS CAN, in 2009. And we started the network uh, in order to ask questions about what was driving coral calcification rates or coral growth rates across uh, about 300 kilometers of reef in the Florida Keys. And we've since expanded our network to uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands and it's revealing a lot of really important and useful information about coral growth rates and what determines them, uh, such as temperature and other things that we want to find out is why certain species will grow better in some places than others. Our Elkhorn experiment came about because, of course, Elkhorn coral is is a ESA listed species, so it listed as threatened, and it's failed to recover over the last 20 to 40 years, despite um, marine protected areas and other measures to try to allow it to come back naturally. So there's been increasing focus on looking to restoration or active uh, interventions to bring corals back to certain places where they used to thrive. And the dry tortugas is an example of uh, where for Elkhorn, now there is only one genetic strain that lives there in a very small population. And so basically it's isolated and cannot sexually reproduce with other corals because corals are, are simultaneous hermaphrodites 
or this species is anyway. So they produce both eggs and sperm, but they can't self-fertilize. So they need to be close to other colonies that are different than, than them genetically so that they can sexually reproduce again. So for this study, you transplanted fragments of elkhorn coral at three reef sites closer to the Keys and two sites in Dry Tortugas National Park. Tell us a little bit more about what you were looking for there. Sure. So our question was, if we take these five strains, five genetic strains that were originally from the Upper Keys and have been uh, nursery raised by the Coral Restoration Foundation, If we brought them to these different sites, um, would these genetic strains thrive in these different places? And would that have a genetic component to that? So in other words, would some genetic strains do better in the, the sites that were near where they were from, or would they do just as well in say the Dry Tortugas, which was 200 kilometers away? So we looked at whether environment, so in other words, site across this continuum from the southwest uh, where Dry Tortugas is all the way up to our most northern site was off of the Miami area in Fowey Rocks and Biscayne National Park. And so we wanted to look at the effects of both the genetics and the environment on the success of our transplants. Tell us a little bit about nursery grown. What does that mean exactly? Where are these nurseries and how do they work? Florida has been a pioneer in uh, establishing coral nurseries and coral farming. And there are a number of conservation groups that have started nurseries. Uh, There's a Moat Marine Lab and there's the University of Miami. and, And then there's the Coral Restoration Foundation, which is the one that sourced our corals that we used in our experiment. And basically what they do is they collect small fragments of corals that are living uh, out on the reef track and bring them into nurseries offshore. So they're still in the ocean, but in more protected environments where um, they can grow them on these, it's kind of like a, they look like Christmas trees. They're tall PVC, structures that have many branches coming off of them and the corals hang from these structures and they grow quite quickly in this situation. And then as they create more, um, they can snip from those existing colonies that they've grown and create more other trees full of corals. And then they can use these for coral outplanting or uh, repopulating degraded reefs throughout the Florida Keys. So describe the experimental blocks that coral is transplanted onto. They look kind of like common cinder blocks. Yes, in fact, they are. They're, they're uh, column blocks, so not a full-sized rectangular cinder block. They're more cubic. And uh, we've attached these to the bottom of the ocean using underwater drills. And, and then we install about six inch threaded rod into the reef with underwater epoxy. And then we place the block on top of those two pins and attach with stainless steel fasteners so that uh, the blocks themselves are very stable. They're attached to the bottom. They have, we installed the first ones in 2009 and um, we've only lost a few through hurricanes, Hurricane Irma, we lost a few at Sombrero Reef, um, but it's usually the reef that fails before our blocks fail because um, the reef itself uh, has you know, porous cavities and things and sometimes chunks of it break off during storms. Yeah, I was wondering how they were stabilized because I looked at the pictures and I thought, well, you know, how are the cinder blocks not going to topple over, especially as you say, if the coral can get so large, but uh, you affix it to the surface of the um, ocean floor. So that's interesting. Yeah, yes, it would definitely not work if we didn't attach them to the bottom. (laughs) So who is involved with placing those blocks with the coral fragments in the various locations? And I guess it was all done via scuba? Yes. So me and my team uh, went out uh, and we used to have to use underwater drills that were attached to the surface 
with a hose and an air compressor. But now we have these underwater battery operated drills, which make it so much easier. Um, so I would say in about an hour and a half dive, we can install probably about 10 blocks, which, which constitutes a site for us is, is 10 blocks. How big were the fragments of coral that you transplanted? The Elkhorn corals that we placed in our experiment reminded me of chicken nuggets in size and color, actually. And so um, they were, you know, quite small, uh, smaller than the palm of your hand, for sure, about a quarter of it, maybe. Now, how tricky was it to relocate the live coral from the Coral Restoration Foundation nurseries to the different Florida reef sites? How did you protect it in transport? Corals are actually quite accommodating in that they don't need to be submerged in water um, as long as you keep them moist and temperature controlled. So we, uh, so the Coral Restoration Foundation staff collects the corals from their nursery. They transported them by boat to uh, the harbor. We met them at the harbor and placed them in our own coolers that had seawater moistened bubble wrap, basically. And then we laid them out carefully so that we know who's who, because we were keeping track of the genetic lines uh, and layered them in this moistened bubble wrap and put them in the truck and uh, went as quickly as possible to our uh, the next site. And, and then we would put them in, once we got there, we'd put them in freshly collected seawater with a, uh, air being bubbled to keep the water moving. Was there a certain position with the placement and certain water depths that were important that you tried to keep consistent? Yes. So all of the the calcification assessment network stations are in about 10 to 14 feet of seawater uh, because we were most interested in the reef crest environment and testing theories about coral growth in that very important reef crest habitat. And how close did you plant the fragments to the one remaining live Elkhorn coral reef in the park? So because Dry Tortugas is such an amazing and special place, uh, we had a number of things that we did to mitigate risk to uh, the natural resources in the park. And one of them was just in case there was something about the corals that we were bringing in and they, for instance, were going to grow differently or not normally, um, we wanted them to be as far away from the remaining protected population near Garden Key. So that was one of the reasons why we established our two sites up at Pulaski Shoal, which is about 15 kilometers away from, or 10 miles away from from the park headquarters where Garden Key is. And another thing we did to mitigate risk was make sure that the the fragments were small so that there couldn't be, you know, pests hiding inside of them. And we made sure that they were healthy. We also didn't transport water into the Dry Tortugas National Park. We we changed our water that the corals were being transported in by boat from Key West So a number of times we changed that water to make sure that there was no bacteria or anything in the water that we brought. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about what kind of pests that you were worried about if you had transplanted larger chunks of the coral. Was bacteria one of the the fears? Yeah, that was one of the fears for sure. Um, You know, the the stony coral tissue loss disease, uh, we still don't know what the pathogen is, but Acropora palmata and cervicornis, for that matter, the elkhorn and the staghorn corals, do not get stony coral tissue loss disease, which, uh, which was one of the reasons why we chose to look at that species right now. But we still didn't know yet if they could be a carrier. So we wanted to make sure that we had very small, healthy colonies, and um, we didn't want any invertebrate hitchhikers like there's a coral over a snail. That, that eats tissue off the, the coral that loves the two acropora species. So we wanted to make sure we didn't have any of those. Now, growth obviously is one of the performance factors that you measured. What else did you measure? What else did you keep your eye on? We did regular weighings. So every six months, uh, the 
you can't really tell from the photographs, but the corals are mounted on plastic discs and the discs have a hole through them and uh, a three inch bolt uh, goes through the disc. And then the corals are attached on top of that with underwater epoxy. So it basically looks like a coral popsicle. And, and you can stick the bolt through the hole on the top of the blocks. And then we attach it with a washer and a wing nut on the underside so that we can come back every six months, remove the corals, uh, put them in these special buckets that we've built that have a place for the bolt to go, kind of like our coral transporters. And we bring all of the corals in seawater back to a dock somewhere. And then we weigh the corals so we get very precise measurements of how much weight they've gained. So the amount of calcium carbonate uh, mineral that they've deposited and made their skeleton. So we get very precise numbers on that. And then they go through a workup where we measure their height, their width, and their depth. And we also take pictures of them from the top and from the sides. Recently, we've added uh, 3D photogrammetry to the mix so that we can look at things like volume. And uh, then we transport them back to our blocks. And, and that whole procedure takes about six hours. All right. Tell us about your findings then. So our findings were actually really surprising. We had known that corals did seem to grow faster in dry tortugas compared to the other uh, sites in the rest of the Florida Keys. But, you know, it was usually subtle between 25 and 50 percent greater growth. Uh, but with this species, they just took off at both sites in the dry tortugas and grew quickly, grew taller, and gained a whole lot more weight. And it was a very clear difference that you could see easily with your eyes. And additionally, survival was not equal among the sites. All 24 corals that we transplanted in the dry tortugas survived and did great. Whereas in the um, middle and upper keys, we had lower survival and lower growth rates. Why do you think the elkhorn coral grew twice as fast in dry tortugas than at the other locations? We think that the corals in dry tortugas must have benefited in some way uh, that we don't have quantitative numbers for yet, but we are going to test our hypothesis. One of the obvious things to look at is temperature, but we did not see temperature differences among the sites that explained the growth during this two year period, because while there was a couple periods of time that did get pretty toasty, the corals in dry tortugas grew faster both in the winter and the summer. So it didn't seem to be a temperature effect. And so our, our new hypothesis that we were testing now with collaborators at the Ohio State University, uh, we're, we're thinking that they might be getting food subsidies because of the oceanographic currents and these upwelling events that have been shown to carry zooplankton and, and other types of organic matter in the water that could serve as an extra food source for the corals. Because corals don't only depend on their symbionts for all their nutrition, they're also predators. They have stinging cells and they capture small zooplankton uh, things like crab larvae and lobster larvae seem to be among their favorites. So that's our hypothesis that we are testing next. Do you think that transplantation might be best done there in the dry tortugas, given your success with the hopes or thought that tides and currents would play an important part of carrying larvae to other parts of the Keys and coral reefs there? Yes, the, the implications of our findings are that because this species can grow so well in the dry tortugas, um, that we are within five to 10 years, we could have a sexually reproducing population there uh, because they're growing so quickly. And, you know, there's a chance that some of our colonies might be sexually reproductive already. 
which is really exciting um, because we brought five new genetic strains. They can start reproducing uh, as soon as next summer. And therefore this would, and, and because of its location, dry tortugas is, is at this nexus of ocean currents and its connectivity to the upper, the upper keys, the, the dry tortugas would be a great place to establish a, a sexually reproducing population again to serve as a source of these sexually reproduced uh, new, new uh, larvae. So that's, that's essentially what we need and if for, for corals to evolve to changing ocean conditions, we need to have sexual recombination because what we've seen is the asexually producing colonies that we have have dwindled. And obviously they're not, um, they're, they're no longer evolutionarily adapted to the situation right now. So we need to help natural selection along. So it sounds like you were doing a little matchmaking. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what else was encouraging or discouraging about your finding? Well, it was a little discouraging that we had low survival in the upper keys and in, in Biscayne in particular, Biscayne National Park. But I don't think all hope is lost because it's just a matter of finding the right genets that can succeed there. And so Biscayne National Park is already participating in elkhorn restoration so uh, they, they will find the right matches, I believe. And, and then once there are populations established with different genetic lines, they can start to reproduce. And genets again are? Uh, the genetic strains. Now, the idea of transplanting coral to make a significant impact seems like it would be a colossal effort. How and when do you think your work, your findings, might be incorporated into a larger National Park Service plan to revitalize Elkhorn coral in that area, the Dry Tortugas area? How much would need to be transplanted to make a difference? Well, you know, I think that's one of the most encouraging results that we found was, you know, our little pilot study actually ended up probably being a restoration event in itself. We actually, our experiment was supposed to be two years long and the last sampling time was supposed to be in April, 2020. But of course, everything was shut down because of the COVID pandemic and we had to leave our corals in place. And um, so we ended the experiment with the existing 18 months worth of data that we had already because the, the uh, results were clear enough already that we had these important trends. And the corals that were left in the field were just left to grow onto these blocks and they completely overgrew them. And so now we can't get them off. And so we're just gonna let them have their blocks and stay there. And, you know, within a few years, we could have, uh, we could have an Elkhorn reef at both of these sites, which is really exciting um, and not something we expected. You know, we, we expected that they would still be small and we would outplant them onto the reef. And, you know, we would see growth rates typical of what we see in the rest of the Florida Keys, but clearly that's not the case. And, and so the answer is, I don't think it will take a whole lot. Uh, that you know we can start to bring small amounts of elkhorn coral into different places in the national park where we can say benefit the most from the restoration of ecosystem services to enhance visitor experience so that they can snorkel on an on a elkhorn reef possibly and uh, well position it so that it once again protects the anchorage of uh, Garden Key and the fort. And so it's, you know, it's establishing benefits for the natural and cultural resources in the national park. And I don't think it will take very much coral to do that. That's very encouraging. So the 18 month component of the study uh, for growth of the transplanted fragments, what was the biggest growth of one of the uh, transplanted fragments? I'm curious to know how big they got. It's really hard to describe in words. So they, they started out as little chicken nugget size pieces and 
all of the ones in the dry tortugas are now probably a foot high with 10 to 20 different branches or blades that they form in multiple levels. I would say they're now taking up the space of a large beach ball maybe now. So yeah, from chicken nugget size to the size of a large beach ball. <laughs> <laughs> do you think 18 months from now they'll double in size or how fast do they grow? What's the growth rate? Well, you know, with this species, it's such a complex morphology, you know, meaning how it grows in, in relation to adding branches versus growing the blades out both in width and length. Uh, so it's, it's difficult to describe the growth. And that's one of the things that we're doing in our next phase of research is doing this 3D photogrammetry. So we can look at those uh, different metrics of growth, like volume and um, height and number of branches, et cetera. You know, traditionally, uh, researchers have really only looked at linear extension or, or the length extension. But one of the interesting things that we found out about our growth data is that the height of the colony was the best predictor of the calcification rates. So that was pretty cool because that reef elevation is one of the key variables that determines how much wave attenuation can occur given a reef that's being restored. So uh, that's gonna be an important metric for people to measure. Where would someone go to see photos of the coral growth in your study? In my paper, there is a link to what's called a USGS data release. So a data release is basically the raw data from our experiment. Everything that we use to make our uh, interpretations of the results. And that includes time series photographs for each coral that was in the study. And so you can click on that uh, data release link and it'll bring you to a landing page. And then there's uh, different files with metadata, which are basically the, the who, what, where, how, when, and then the data sets themselves, which it's a zipped folder with all of the, the time series photographs. Very good. Now, you know, with all the environmental assaults on coral, some controllable, some not, what would you like listeners to know about small things they can do to protect coral reefs? Uh, well, I think being educated about coral reefs, if you're interested in them, is probably the best way of uh, staying informed with what's going on with corals and going out to see them, enjoying them, uh, while they're here. I mean, I, th I think things are hopeful that uh, we will, that coral reefs will persist. And, you know, there are volunteer opportunities with places like the Coral Restoration Foundation. There's opportunities for citizen science. Uh, I believe more and more these days, there's an interesting, I would have to research this, but I, I believe there's citizen science available where you can take photographs of corals that are growing in, in the field or out on the reef um, and send and upload your photographs to, to a website for researchers to use. So if you see any coral disease out there, um, you know, something that just doesn't look right about the coral, like it's white or it's losing its tissue or something's going on, um, you can document that photographically and help science by contributing those photographs. I have to say that I've seen documentaries on the mass degradation of coral around the world, and I've seen bleached coral reefs myself, but I have to say I'm comforted by the work done by folks like you and the attention paid to coral. And it sounds like in general, you're pretty hopeful too. Yeah, I, I am. I think, uh, you know, we've done over the last five decades as, as a science community, we've done a lot of documenting decline. And for a while, yeah, it was getting very depressing that all you're doing is, is measuring the amount of loss. But within the last decade in, in particular, there's been a real shift in the way that people are thinking about reef conservation going from uh, what was more a passive 
approach where we set aside marine parks and protected areas and hope that things come back on their own to shifting to more of an active restoration approach where we're actually helping corals move from one place to another, rearing them in nurseries and outplanting them. And uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of exciting research going on about how to best ramp up coral populations in a way that they'll start sexually reproducing on their own again. An additional reason why I think there's hope for coral reefs is the amount of variance the, that we see in nature. For example, in my experiment, all the corals that were brought to the dry tortugas uh, survived. And this allowed us to test whether the genetic strain was important in determining growth patterns. And indeed, there was a very subtle but uh, statistically significant effect of the genetic strain. And so this is exciting because, you know, we only had six different strains in the dry tortugas that we were testing, but you saw these subtle differences. So the fact that there is enough genetic variance out there in nature right now that you would see these differences makes it hopeful that we have enough opportunity for sexual recombination in order to keep pace with the changing ocean. Dr. Kuffner, thank you very much for your time and please keep us posted on the continuation of your work. I certainly will. Thank you very much for listening. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. While there are a few times throughout the year when we specifically campaign for financial support, we need it all year long. If you enjoy listening to these podcasts, in reading the news and features we bring you every day of the year at National Parks Traveler, we hope you'll invest in that coverage with a donation to ensure that stories will be there tomorrow. You can find a donate button near the top of the pages at nationalparkstraveler.org. Or you can send a check to National Parks Traveler, Post Office Box 980-452, Park City, Utah, 84098. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit news organization. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast series is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.